Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the very first Open GovCon. And what we're trying to do with this event is to make it a, a series of sessions like this that's bringing together open source contributors, folks that leverage open source software, and technical leadership both on public sector and private sector with this idea that we all need to band together to build safer, more secure, more reliable digital infrastructure and acknowledge that digital infrastructure impacts every citizen globally in their everyday lives. I mean, it's amazing how much software is something that is uh, required in our daily lives. It, it's, we interact with it when we go to work. Uh, we rely on its safety when we interact with elevators, subway cars, et cetera. We file our taxes with it. We communicate with it. The internet runs off of it. And so it's critical, again, that we band together as a community as a way to do better and help each other to build a safer, more secure world. So to kick us off then, we have two fantastic speakers. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves and just give the top level. But Rob is from the DoD CIO team. Uh, he has just an amazing background, uh, tons of software experience inside of the DoD, helping deliver some of the most challenging systems in very challenging situations uh, with, with excellence. Uh, he's helped the DoD think about what it means to have software intensive programs be the norm and how to move from buying these monolithic applications into this new way of technology, which is frequent updates and um, you know, smaller but more frequent updates. And similar thing from the CISA side, so just you, um, you know, fantastic background again, uh, lots of background on the software transparency side. Uh, and with that, we're just gonna kind of hear a pretty interesting expose on how we're talking about digital infrastructure in 2023. So I'll turn it over to Justin to start it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great. Great. So I've got a few notes here. So. Um, first of all, I'm Justin Murphy. I work for uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, my agency is the uh, CISA, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, I work for the C in CISA, the cybersecurity part, the cybersecurity division, uh, specifically for the vulnerability management disclosure br branch. Uh, since I've been at CISO, we are per perpetually realigning, so soon we'll be called something different. Uh, so next conference, hear me speak, it'll be something different. But anyway, uh, we, uh, I, I work with Dr. Alan Friedman, who you may be familiar with, who you may have even been expecting to be here instead of me. Sorry you're stuck with me, mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, Alan sends his best. Uh, but I, I work on the CISO SBOM team, uh, SBOM DEX, uh, technology assurance related projects, things like that. And uh, yeah, transparency uh, is something that, that we are uh, passionate about, uh, emphatic about, and um, is, is really driving um, the way that we think about open source software and why we are here today and wanted to be a part of, of Open GovCon. So, you know, one thing that we, we really want to hit on, uh, and I think hope, hopefully you all agree with me, is that when we look at open source and we look at open source software from the supply chain perspective, we have to think of it a little bit differently. Uh, we have to think of it a little bit differently than we might think about it traditionally in industry, especially when you look at it from uh, sort of the manufacturing perspective. Uh, it can be challenging, intimidating. Uh, uh, we like to call it a challenge or an opportunity. Uh, and just because that is the case, just because it's a, it's a difficult problem and may be difficult for us to kind of wrap our brain around, uh, that does not mean that we, especially the U.S. government and we at CISA, it does not mean that we should not and could not uh, do something about it. Uh, so what is our U.S. government standpoint? Uh, on uh, open source software. Uh, we believe that it is a huge part of our critical infrastructure. It's a huge part of our public infrastructure. Uh, the US government, uh, and CISO is part of that, acknowledges and believes that open source software is part of that public infra infrastructure. And we are committed from a policy perspective and from a technical reality or technical necessity perspective, we are committed to uh, uh, the effort around securing our open source software supply chain. So hopefully everyone at this point uh, accepts that there's no going back. <laughs> there's no going back. Well, that is not an option. We are going, there's no going back on using open source software. Uh, similar to the private sector, the federal government, uh, and also, you know, the, uh, down to the SLTT uh, level, we are highly, highly dependent on open source software. 
And so uh, part of the foundation of our critical infrastructure, supporting every single critical infrastructure uh, sector and every national uh, critical function, open source software is a big part of that. So where does CISA play a part in this? Uh, and we believe our US government partners play a part, of, part in this as we are committed uh, to helping harden the, the open source software ecosystem. Uh, so CISA's mission, if you're not familiar, uh, part of that mission is understanding, managing, and reducing risks to the federal uh, government, but that's also to our uh, national critical, critical infrastructure as well. And, and so we have to take steps. We have to take steps to better understand and protect the open source software that we are so reliant upon, highly, highly reliant upon. Uh, we recognize the inherent, what I believe to be the inherent public good nature of open source software. Uh, and that any efforts to secure the broader uh, open source software ecosystem is only going to help uh, us help us all. You know, sure, there's some disguised self-interest in that. We'll acknowledge that. Of uh, you know, that's going to help the federal government and our critical infrastructure. Uh, but you, you, if you haven't been paying attention, I'm sure you all are familiar with uh, the national cybersecurity strategy that was released in March. Um, CISA is aligned with that strategy, which does, in part of its strategic, strategic object objectives, it does call out um, that we are to collaborate with not only the private sector, but also the open source software community. And CISA is committed to doing that. It's something we're already doing, but it's something that uh, we, we are uh, putting a lot of attention, energy, and focus on moving forward as well. We, CISA recognizes the benefits of open source software. Uh, it's, it's, it, it enables software development uh, to happen at an incredible pace. Uh, it fosters significant innovation and cl uh, collaboration efforts. Uh, but what we also realize, we have to enable the secure usage and development of that open source software, uh, both within and outside the federal government. Uh, I mentioned earlier, there are challenges but we'd like to refer to them as challenges and opportunities, and there's some unique ones that come with open source software. Uh, we believe a big part of that is just mindset, you know, changing our mindset. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning we have to think differently when we look at the su supply chain from an open source perspective. Uh, I think a huge difference, a key difference, is the lack of a traditional customer supplier model. Um, for the most part, the people writing and maintaining these open source projects are not suppliers uh, in the traditional sense, right? Uh, there's not a business relationship that comes from that, uh, where the organizations who are using the software, they're, you know, the people who are maintaining these in many cases are volunteers, they're writing the code and putting in the effort, uh, and they put it online and under licenses, and while they are putting it online for people to use, there's not really an exchange or there's not really anything that they're getting from that in most cases. Uh, so one thing that we have to think about moving forward and we are not the only ones who are thinking about this, but what we are thinking about is, is how, do, how do we go about incentivizing uh, the maintainers of these projects to implement secure usage and deployment uh, and development? And that's, that's a, uh, a challenging opportunity <laughs> that, that we're excited about. And, and, and we think it's, as US government, it's, it's our responsibility to look into that. Because um, that's, that's, that's an area where we can affect change. Um, Open source software, you know, as a public good, is supported by diverse and wide-ranging communities. Um, we try to uh, involve those communities in a lot of the work that we're doing, but one thing that we also think needs to happen is we need to go in the other direction as well. We need to be involved in that community, uh, some, you know, if you want to say, for lack of a better term, as a stakeholder, uh, integrate ourselves within that. So we believe CISA and the rest of the U.S. government, we need to integrate and support these communities. Uh, particularly focusing on the critical open source software components which the federal government uses. Uh, and, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so it's, as it stands, CISA up to this point has engaged in a lot of various areas uh, that implicate open source software. One of those is SBOM. I mentioned I'm part of this as an SBOM team, Software Bill of Materials. I'm hoping you're all familiar with that. If not, come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. There's a lot. There's, I think there's like 12 different talks that involve at least subtly some SBOM uh, topics here. And I'll be trying to be at all of them. Uh, and also we, we help to coordinate. I mentioned I'm with the Vulnerability Management Disclosure Branch. Um, if you saw the CISO GitHub repository, uh, um, I was one of the maintainers of that. Please be forgiving. If it helped you, please come talk to me. If it didn't, uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't uh, hold your criticism to yourself, please. Uh, <laughs> um, but SBOM, I, I, you know, that's, that's sort of uh, my 
where I, where I fall and where my, uh, most of my day-to-day -day work falls. Um, you know, we built uh, SBOM um, to be things that can be provided, provided by a lot of different approaches, and anyone can really write an SBOM. That, that is true. Is, has anybody heard of SOOS, S-O-O-S, SOOS.io? Check it out if you haven't, S-O-O-S.io. Um, this is proof of that, that uh, SUSE, it, it can scan, uh, scan software uh, projects uh, they're down their dependency graphs um, and, and their transitive dependencies and, and create SBOMs within seconds. And so this, this proves that anybody can provide SBOMs, and we built it to be, to be like that. Uh, for private sector organizations, but also for the federal government, obviously, uh, if you want to track your open source usage, we believe SBOM is absolute, an absolutely critical first step to that because you can't make decisions without data. So those are some of the efforts that have, are there ongoing and, and still going on. Love to talk to you more about that. Uh, what is coming next uh, or what is out there and kind of what we have our eyes on from a support area, from a tooling, a collaboration uh, mindset. Uh, what we have our eyes on are, uh, we're really excited about Salsa, if you're, if you're familiar with Salsa. Uh, Guac is new and interesting, we have our eyes on that. Uh, we're excited about VEX, uh, <laughs> if, uh, Vulnerability exploited, Exploitability Exchange, we have uh, equities in that. We actually uh, facilitate the uh, VEX working group, meets Monday mornings, e Eastern Time, 10 a.m. All are welcome, please join us uh, every week. Um, if you go to cisa.gov slash SBOM, you can see the newly released minimum requirements for VEX that we, we put out uh, last month. Um, we think it's important to recognize VEX as something separate from SBOM, but complementary to SBOM. But in the open source space, VEX, I think, what we're hearing from a lot of the people we're talking about, especially in the cloud provider space, uh, and SaaS space, is, is VEX is, is, is really important. Uh, we believe transparency is the key, uh, and VEX can be written by anyone, just like I mentioned, you know, SBOMs. Uh, it's just a matter, I think, of trust relationships, uh, who, you know, if you can trust who they come from. And we believe that lends itself well to the, the open source uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have our working groups. We have five total working groups. We have a VEX working group, and we have four SBOM working groups. If you are not aware of these working groups and would like to get involved, please talk to me afterwards. You can also email sbom at cisa.dhs.gov. Um, what is next for CISA and open source software? Uh, a lot of things. What are, how am I doing on time, by the way? Great, great. Okay. Uh, what are some of those other things that we have going on and we're, we're excited about? Uh, we are doing some meaningful, meaningful work around software identity. Uh, this is not an old problem. Um, this is uh, uh, something that's been around, um, or it is an old problem, sorry, it's not a new problem. Something that's been around for a very, very long time. Alan, myself, I actually, if you were at the Open Source Summit Europe, I gave a talk about software identity and how we were kind of beginning to think about it. We've evolved, hopefully, since then because uh, that was last September, but, uh, and some of my other colleagues have given talks if you're in the OT space or have any eyes on that. My, my colleague, Lindsay Serkovnik, gave a talk at S4 about software identity, so we're, it's something we're, we're starting to talk about publicly. There's other groups who are doing that too and some other working groups that are working on it. Uh, and, and we are prioritizing that and focusing on that because if SBOM's gonna work, if VEX is gonna work, software identity is something uh, that's, that's going, we're gonna have to find a solution. And, and we're gonna need your help, we're gonna need everybody's help to figure out what, what solution works best for all of us. Because uh, our emphasis and what we prioritize is interoperable solutions. Not, a, not just a solution, but the idea of the possibility of multiple solutions as long as they're interoperable and working together. Uh, we're, we're, we try to avoid giving too many stamps of approval because we don't feel like that's our, our, our role or, or there's not too much of an uh, incentive for us to do that. So, uh, or it's not, it's not, it doesn't help the community if we do that. So, uh, also in the open source, source wor world, uh, we are going to be um, looking at possibly releasing a public strategy, uh, sort of a unified public strategy. As of, as of yet, we don't have that out there, but we think that that could be helpful. Uh, is sort of seeding some things, uh, seeding some conversations, some working groups, and, and, and helping drive change. Um, uh, and, and one other thing that we want to acknowledge is some of the amazing efforts that, uh, that are being done uh, to document open source projects uh, that we've been pay paying attention to. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, open source census, the work from Frank Nagel. Um, and, and from a critical government, you know, critical infrastructure government national security perspective, we are trying to understand 
what are the unique risks that, that rise to the critical infrastructure level for us? Things, uh, if you're familiar with the KEV, we've seen things like uh, the uh, known exploited vulnerability database. Uh, we, we released a critical software list. Uh, we're looking at would something like that be helpful for the open source space as well? And, or has, it, has some of those things already been helpful in the open source space? So those are some of the other things that we're looking at. Uh, in summary, and I'll turn it over uh, to my friend from DOD over here, uh, Transparency is key. Um, we, we, we truly, truly believe that, and we're emphatic about that. And building things off of models of transparency is only going to help us all. Uh, open source software, like I said, it's different. Uh, we have to look at it differently um, and from fresh perspectives, uh, especially since there is the lack of that traditional customer supplier model that I mentioned. Uh, open source software is part of our public infrastructure and our critical infrastructure and we have to work uh, to, to secure it uh, because we're so highly dependent upon it, not only in the federal space, but also in the private sector space. Uh, we at CISA, uh, we recognize that we need to integrate ourselves more into uh, supporting these communities, the open source community. Uh, and we have a lot of exciting stuff going on that we invite any and all to participate in, whether you find yourself in the federal space, the open source space, the private sector, all of the above. Uh, we have our working groups. Um, uh, we also try to make ourselves as accessible as possible, My, myself, uh, Alan, uh, the rest of our SBOM team. So love to hear from you. Uh, we love to be challenged. We love to be proven wrong. Uh, we love to be, we, we, we thrive under uh, uh, constructive criticism as long as it's somewhat polite. No, okay. uh, but thank you very much. Uh, uh, glad to be here today. I'll be here all week through Friday. Please find me. Uh, I'll be walking around and, and would love to talk to you. So thanks. Okay, Rob. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And thanks for all the work that SIS has been doing in this space. Um, so, Rob Vietmeyer, DoD Chief Software Officer. Uh, first, let me, I'll stand over here. First, let me say um, uh, thanks to the open source community, thanks to Linux Foundation, uh, thanks to Kyle for pulling this together. I mean, I think this the sense of how we're going to pull together uh, the government, the open source community, industry, and academia to move forward. So I'm really excited about uh, kicking this off here today and uh, the next step. So um, I have loved the open source community. I love the, the sense of uh, collaboration that it has entailed. I love the, the capabilities that it continues to uh, deliver and lead. Um, I'm always amazed at the amount of effort that people will donate oftentimes without recognition, without uh, financial benefit, um, to keep moving the space forward. So thanks, um, uh, thanks for everyone that's uh, participating in, in helping us move. We are definitely in a software-defined world, uh, thanks in large part to the efforts of, of this community. Um, we are now facing this, this next set of challenges um, as we move forward with how do we get better at security and, and the supply chain sorts of attacks as these design patterns, we'll say. But let me, yeah, thanks for all the late hours, uh, you know, the um, uh, Red Bull-fueled uh, uh, late nights. For me, it was Diet Cherry Coke, um, but I know how that works. Uh, you know, they're trying to solve those logic pu puzzles, uh, trying to figure out where did I miss a semicolon? You know, all the, the hassles and fun that, that comes along with de 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 delivering software. So really appreciate all the work and look, look at what's happened now. I think the quote was that um, this morning that almost, uh, looking at the systems, 98% of them involve or built on open source uh, across the globe. And there was argument that that seems low, <laughs> right? Which I agree with. And I don't think uh, many people realize how much open source is actually driving this next uh, this next revolution. Um, sorry for the uniform. I, I old habits uh, die hard. I did put on my elastic socks though, so I have elastic <laughs> socks on. Um, just a little a, a little uh, yeah, symbol. Uh, next time I will t wear t-shirt and hoodie and uh, fit in better. But uh, it's a, it's a comfort factor. You get used to this in the, the DC area. Um, let's see. So let's talk about. Uh, the Department of Defense for a little bit. So we are, uh, you know, a micro, a, a large system um, that represents, I think, a lot of the conversation we heard at the sessions this morning. Like, how do we go from where we are now to where we know we need to be? Um, 
In DoD, we have, um, I would argue, probably the most complex set of systems and IT landscape that one can imagine, because we have every technology ever invented is still operational today. Maybe not every, so, so there was a report from a few years ago, this is a GAO audit, um, that pinged us for running nuclear command and control on a system that was backed up on eight inch floppies. We have now replaced that, I can happy report, so we are no longer using, as near as I can tell, no longer using eight inch floppies. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Okay, so Midman, we're, we're get yeah, we, we have a little bit more uh, work to do, I guess. Uh, uh, but yeah, any COBOL or ADA programmers, uh, yeah, we have jobs for you still. Um, but what's been interesting is watching this transi transition in the department as senior leadership is starting to realize the value of software, um, mainly from a missions capability perspective, that we are a, a software-defined world. Uh, we are a software-defined military, uh, and increasingly so. Our mission capabilities, our mission success is dependent upon uh, how well we deliver, maintain, and update software. We've seen this in past conflicts where um, we were using our traditional waterfall deployment models and to, to push updates into the field, and we found our adversaries were able to change tactics and techniques faster than we could implement software. And so we were falling behind from an OODA loop perspective. And so that realization was kind of one of the real first driving points that we need to do software differently. We need to do it better. Um, it started this evolution of this journey we're on in the department that we refer to as DevSecOps and, and software modernization. Um, where we are on that journey right now, so we have a handful of programs that have been on the cutting edge. And from the CIO perspective, we have been trying to remove uh, the policy roadblocks, the process roadblocks to enable those programs to be successful, uh, but also looking at how do we then extend for those fast followers? How do we make start to make this um, the default rather than, um, than, than the exception? And we're early in that journey. I think uh, if you look at the, you know, our software factories, we're, you know, up over 50 to 60 of those that we're uh, tracking now. I encourage the group um, to come back. We have a sessions later uh, on, the, on the software factory ecosystem. And here in the audience, we have our uh, Air Force Platform One team, which has been the, a real leader in, in that effort. Um, so we're trying to build off, off of those efforts. We're trying to um, bring along the next set we've been working on. How do we start to optimize our, our uh, the non-recurring engineering side of that? So most of the Factories are built on open source tools in the CI/CD pipeline. Um, we are trying to um, uh, make those available through uh, efforts like Platform One's Iron Bank. We've standardized how do we secure containers from a, a cross DoD perspective. We still have a little more work to get uh, all of the AOs, authorizing officials, the CISOs understanding what it means to have a container in Kubernetes and how to secure it. So stand by. That's the you know that my next challenge is to uh, bring along those stakeholders and say, hey, listen, we are doing um, great work as a community securing these. Um, these individual components, using infrastructure's code to give you uh, fast stand up on capabilities, um, to focus our cybersecurity efforts on continual improvement on how do we lock down and approve, uh, improve those, um, uh, these pipeline, these pipeline capabilities, the automation. Um, this is something that will never be done. And what's interesting is this really, this transition in the department where we've previously focused almost all of our security on production operations. And we had all these rules that said like, well, you know, production is in its own silo and then, you know, dev and test and you have to build these walls between them. And we're finding that uh, what we did was we focused here and we sort of paid no attention to the development side of things, the testing side of things. That was someone else's problem. We're gonna secure everything here. So where are we seeing the attacks, right? So now, uh, the quote was this morning, 768% uh, increase in the number of supply chain attacks. Um, every time I hear that number, it's increasing, right, in terms of the percentage uh, that, uh, which we can expect, because that's where our adversaries are going after, right? We, they realize that um, we are soft and vulnerable 
in a lot of the supply chain because it was always this dark art of the software developers, right? And, we, and folks never understood it. And so, yeah, someone else go off and do that piece of it. We will check it when it comes into, uh, before it goes into production. And that's where we'll focus and then we'll try to secure it in production. That process no longer works, right? Um, and so we're on this journey. And so with CISA and the executive orders and the OMB guidance um, that folks are probably aware of, um, looking at SBOMs, the Secure Software Development Framework from NIST, on the DoD side, we've published all our guidance on, on DevSecOps, which you know, actually gives, um, builds and maps to SSDF. Um, it was there before SSDF, um, but it's a little more prescriptive, and here's what you need to be doing in your CI, CD pipelines. Um, we are just coming out with some new guidance now where we've started to pull in more of the um, other executive agents responsible in the department. So we've coordinated with um, our test, uh, uh, test and evaluation community so that all of the test guidance that comes out of that is now fully baked into our guidance. Uh, we're, we're continuing to work the cybersecurity, um, but it's a community effort, right? So what we're seeing right now is attacks, uh, the, we're being attacked where we're most vulnerable and they're relatively simple. Um, so I think a type, uh, um, um, a typo squatting uh, types of attacks on, on general repos, uh, simple attacks on build libraries, um, attacking us because we're, we don't have necessarily strong identity and credential management and privilege management within our pipelines. We, we can, t us and our, our suppliers can be um, relatively weak on that side of things. Um, you know, more advanced attacks, uh, pipeline poisoning and other things, those are starting to evolve at an increasing rate. Um, so we now need to have a level of sophistication um, to combat those attacks. We're starting to see our adversaries use AI to find and optimize their attack patterns against the supply chain. Uh, we are not seeing as much, though it's evolving now as, as our own um, teams using AI to figure out where they're vulnerable, where should they start to optimize in terms of addressing uh, potential attacks within the CI uh, pipeline or even within the code itself. So uh, using some of the emerging AI capabilities to take a look at you know, software, give recommendations, and, and to look at potential vulnerabilities or bugs in that software. Uh, that's emerging. We still have to deal with all the problems of, uh, with AI, with its uh, hallucinations and uh, its, uh, some biases get built into it and, and you know, some, some of these non-deterministic patterns. We're going to have to deal with that, but uh, our adversaries are, are adapting these uh, tools and tactics very, very quickly. Um, and so we're going to have to be just as aggressive in how we're maturing. Um, really appreciate the discussions this morning that the Linux Foundation's been investing into how do we get better at securing our, our, our software, the open source community. Uh, really appreciate the work that David Wheeler's been doing as the secure software develop pipeline uh, uh, lead for the Linux Foundation. Um, we're trying to build off those same things. So as we're moving forward as a community, you know, incorporating uh, SBOMs, which, you know, Let's start there. It should be the easy, like here's the list of ingredients, right? Here's what's in your software. I think the bigger challenge is now getting into how was that software developed? Was it developed in a secure way? I'm excited about the progress we're making as a community. I'm excited about the information sharing that's happening with our vendors, with the open source community, with the department. We need to continue to build on that and accelerate, but uh, I think we're making progress. Yep, that's Kyle. excellent. Yep, thank you so much. Yeah. So amazing. Um, a few things that I took away from this. One, it's really encouraging to hear how the U.S. isn't focused on just defending U.S. assets, taking the lessons learned and only talking about it behind closed doors. But instead, you heard about you know GitHub resources. You heard about working groups that are trying to engage with industry. And I think as this community grows, we just need to lean into that even yeah. more. So thank you to you both. And then with the time we have left, let's just go ahead and uh, you know open it up for questions. Yep. Hi, so uh, Camden and Katie from, from Platform One here. So you mentioned that we don't have a typical uh, supplier-customer relationship with most of the open source community. Um, 
but we're obviously a stakeholder. We've got a vested interest in these products being good, with them being secure, with them being frequently updated, and, and their library, their dependencies being updated, and things like that. How do you um, see us incentivizing the open source maintainers and DoD program offices and 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 everyone in between? How do we incentivize the right behaviors there if it's not by being a, a paid customer with a contract to hold someone to? Yeah. Okay, um, so I think that's a, that, that's an ongoing effort that we need to work on. I, I think that um, the the White House did a great job of publishing um, the executive order on saying we need to move the the department forward with S bombs and secure software development. I think NIST and CISA working on the standards, um, both for what do these processes look like, as well as the standards for how do we rep, how do we collect everything from S bombs to to um, attestations for SSDF, right? Um, I think, so we're looking at the, the best practices side of things, um, the guidance in terms of requirements. We are working with the FAR Council to how do we build this into uh, contractual language. So even if it's uh, um, an open source uh, port, port, uh, delivery as well as proprietary software, we'll have the same requirements that these artifacts need to be delivered. Um, and you saw, you know, that's having an impact already. So you see the Linux Foundation and others responding on, here's how we're going to to um, make this uh, um, uh, standard practice, right, within the community. I get it's hard, right? So it's um, it's a lot of effort. we got to turn software developers into start thinking also like cybersecurity folks and vice versa and, and figure out how we... We pull that together. Um, I'm excited about some of the, the new education and training. A couple of things we are also looking at in the department that are, I'd love to have the conversation on what, how could we do more? So we are looking at, um, for things like small businesses, how do we, and we've had a, a large concern with small businesses on being unable to protect um, CUI data, the department, and so we're looking at how do we make investments to uh, provide services to enable a small business to be able to protect CUI. Um, I'm pulling a thread within the department to see not only that, but how can we stand up um, secure pipelines, so if the small business is not just protecting, but we also want small businesses and others to be able to deliver uh, secure software. So how can we support them with um, secure pipelines that meet the SSDF requirements. What would that look like? So nothing official yet, but we are trying to pull those, those threads. There's, um, if you look at the, uh, the uh, federal cybersecurity strategy, right? So it made a call, call of action for government to large businesses to work together to solve this, to then help to pick up a, broad, a bigger piece of the share of uh, bringing along the community, the open source developers, the small businesses. How do we continue to drive innovation. It wasn't prescriptive and here are the actions we're gonna take. And so we're trying to pull the threads on what is the most valuable. So moving beyond best practices and standards to like how do we actually enable this? We get that running a CI, a secure CI CD pipeline is a really expensive proposition and takes a lot of expertise today. We need to make that much simpler um, and then and continue to incorporate um, more and more advanced cybersecurity tools and techniques into uh, those pipelines, into our production systems as well. I don't know the exact form or factor, but we are trying to pull on, on, um, pull on some of those ideas. So if folks have ideas, come see me. We'll see if we can't make it a reality for the next, uh, come back and talk about it here next year. Can I speak on that, yeah, please? Yeah, so um, I think for, for us, I, I mentioned transparency is key, and, and we have to, we can say that, but we have to uh, demonstrate that as well and, and, and abide by that. You know, I think in some cases, maybe uh, there, there's times where it's necessary uh, to be a little bit withholding and operate uh, under some sort of a black box model, but in my experience, that doesn't necessarily work as well, and it doesn't benefit the broader ecosystem and the community as a whole. So we we are trying to drive change within ourselves, not just asking for you know the open source community to come to us, but we need to meet them where they are as well, and and integrate ourselves uh, into the open source community. Um, and and we do a great job of inviting people to join in on our working groups. We're trying to also. 
uh, be involved uh, with some of the working groups going on out there. So the uh, Open SSF uh, and and uh, the SBOM Everywhere group. I don't, I don't know if anybody uh, is familiar with that group. Um, that's 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 a group that we started to join, and we're looking at some of those other efforts going on. Um, where are some other things that government can actually drive change and help? Policy. Um, policy is a big part of that. So how do we uh, drive change in in our own policies and and uh, wider you know. Uh, uh, policy that, that's going to be adopted by industry. Uh, one of those is how, how can we look at, so like CISA, um, how can we look at changing our policies where some of the tools that we're, bu we're building, that we make those available in an open source way? Um, how do we look into uh, having our developers uh, be contributors and help in maintaining open source repositories the other way around? Instead of just using them and saying thanks, uh, and when it doesn't work, we get upset with you, how can we actually uh, help in, in, from that standpoint. So there's there's policy changes and things like that that we can look at and drive change there. Uh, funding. Um, if if you are building tools and you have, um, uh, it's, I guess it's not necessarily part of the open source model is, is the idea of getting money for it. Thank you. Uh, but um, is that something that we can look at? And and if a, if you're using. Uh, particular open source projects more than others, is that some, how can you build that into your cybersecurity funding for the year? Um, also, I think the way that we can also drive change is through education. Uh, K through 12, all the way down to K through 12 education. How, how can we uh, spend R&D money? How can we spend money in driving changes starting from that point that people are, uh, are being educated to uh, insecure code, uh, memory safe languages, all, all those type things. Uh, so when they go out and work in private sector, or they come and work for the government, whatever, it's just inherent in them that that, that is uh, something that we do as a community and as a uh, information, security, uh, information security ecosystem. So. Yeah, that's excellent. So we have time for one quick follow-up. Um, so uh, our I, my name is Lucy Hyde. I am a program manager here at the Linux Foundation. I represent PyTorch, AI, and Data, uh, Sonic, and Nephio. But previously, I was the chief data scientist at JSON. So I've been on right. both sides of the coin, yeah. um, you know, uh, both deploying on air gap networks, but on the yeah. side of the coin representing OS foundations. Are we eligible from the Linux Foundation to be CRADA partners? Is there any restrictions for us to enter into a CRADA agreement with the DOD or with the government as a whole? because that would be a way in which the government could interface at the program management level. We could work with our foundations to, sped up, to set up special interest groups or other work groups okay. where we could find and advocate to the community to dedicate maintainers to meet your needs. That way, as the creators are typically two to three years long, depending on okay. the benchmarks that they meet or that they need to meet, and it's also not monetary, so we're not impinging on any or impeding on any type of contracting opportunities or, you know, open and fair competition or antitrust. Um, is that an opportunity that we can advocate from a program management side to our foundations? The, the answer to that for us is yes, and uh, we would obviously want to have conversations and, and you know, uh, what exactly that, that would look like and, and talk that out. Because uh, it's super easy to work with the government. We're really straightforward, and we're really <laughs> yeah. The red tape is low. But no, I lo we love to low. talk. We love yeah. to talk more about that for sure. Yeah, yeah. great answer. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're kind of right at time, but I know you're here all this week. Rob's yeah. here today. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much. We're gonna break till I think ten minutes after, then we'll do a, we'll start back up again with a panel discussion on software practice. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.